And the reality, the reality is that that's the through line and to our history as black people here. And so, you know, I think that we have to deconstruct this idea that, that, that everything great is associated to the white standards, right? Great is great because we make it great. And, you know, we can talk, we can, have, we, I can go down a rabbit hole about this. I would dare to say that everything great in this country has, you know, has a black face behind it, but story for another day. And like I said, we're here for the rabbit holes for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Moore, your thoughts? I, I mean, it, I can't add much on it. It is not much frosting left to put on this cake because uh, Brother Stevens hit it all. I, I, I'll say this, what, what, what is really worth, let me say this first, guilty. Sam mm. Cook, Eddie Moore Jr., guilty. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, second, seduction. I think that's a really interesting term that Malcolm chose mm. because there's some reality to that that, that, that there's a weaning of you. There's a drawing you away, right? Yeah. From your essence, from your grounding, from your foundation, right. guilty. And I can remember the earliest days thinking, I can't wait to get me some of them shoes like those cats, man. Right. Yeah. I can't wait to drive me a car like those cats, man. Like, like, like just really having my mind focused on thinking moving in that direction is mm. what made me valuable. Mm. It was whiteness is seducing. It is a seduction. And I, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. And and I tell you, Naeem Akbar is one who really. I was fortunate to have some in, in interaction with early on in my earliest development. I remember coming to the Brothers of the Academy where we would all gather, you know, once a year. And I used to just ask the brothers, y'all got to help me just mm -hmm. continue to extract some of this whiteness out of my system because I've been bombarded. So I want to start by admission that guilty, 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 that seduction is real. And I think that's been part of what came up, that's a big part of what came up for me when I was watching Sam Cook, feeling like, as Brother Steven said, like, I like a five star every now and then across the board. And damn it, I deserve it, because I'm excellent. Mm -hmm. I've worked hard, right? Like, where did I make that white? Like, where did I make that better associated with whiteness is what I'm trying to re-examine, unravel. Because I think for so long, I thought I was trying to pursue a, a kind of level that was associated with people when it took some real understanding of my history, my people's history to know, like we built this place. We put the math, the science, like we, we put the essence of what allows this place to function at the highest level that is functioning. We put the essential ingredients in the ground. Right there, the seasoning. And, and I think that that's something I'm still reminding myself of, still checking myself up on, having young kids now trying to always be, you know, helping them to understand from the TV they're watching, the songs they're listening to, the stars they're admiring. I mean, that seduction is real. And I tell you, Sam Cooke, that scene that, that uh, I, I, was, I was trying to be Malcolm, but <laughs> woo, I, 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 I got a little Sam in me. That's, that's, that's where I'm going to leave it right there. Without a doubt, uh, and I appreciate all of that. I'm going to actually combine two questions in a way so we can uh, segue into our second, third moving forward. Um, so what we know is that the movie, after the brothers get together, is, is shot in very few locations. Um, and one thing that stands out is that although there are numerous times the characters move away from each other, they are always together never, in, in terms of never being alone in one way or another. Uh, there's moments where Malcolm and Jim are just in the room and Cassius and Sam are out at the car down to the store. There's moments when it's Cassius and Jim. There's moments when all four are on the rooftop. Um, and it reminds me of, of James Baldwin's statement back in the day when he was asked in an interview, you know, why do black people travel in numbers? And he said, well, I have the answer to that. It's because we need witnesses. Mm -hmm. Coupling that with 
the 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 other element of the movie of this idea of brotherhood it seems like no matter how hard they're going at each other there tends to be a level of support there Cassius is just stepping in saying you know Malcolm you didn't have to go so hard on Sam Cassius is telling Sam you know he's just looking out for me Sam Malcolm has my back uh, they're supportive of each other Jim coaching Malcolm along to get the courage to tell Cassius you know there's a rift going on between me and the nation and I don't want you to feel slighted my question to both y'all brothers is uh, what can we learn from this display of masculinity, uh, this, display, this display of brotherhood and emotional support, especially in a time, first and foremost, in a community where that is not necessarily at the top of the priority list, and especially at the time um, when you put those two uh, things together in terms of this emotional support, be willing to show your emotions. You know, Malcolm almost came to tears in front of Jim. Uh, what can we learn from that display of masculinity and brotherhood? in 1964 at this particular time. I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Moore. Yeah, I'll say quickly that, um, I mean, we somewhat alluded to this earlier, and I think Jim Brown's opening scene with his best friend or good friend was just a reminder. I mean, this is a big brother. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we're not talking about in the cases of these gentlemen, some of them being in some of the tip top shape of their life and knowing that in America, you still, no matter what suit you put on, what muscles you put on, you're still subject to death. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there is some awareness, especially in that time, that they definitely got to be not only a witness for one another, but in support of one another. Right. And I think that's, I mean, that emotional part, I mean, I, I, you know, I got, I got, I mean, that's, that's a part of me that just was not developed. It was hardened. It was cemented. I'm still trying to, I feel like I got an ice cube inside and I'm still trying to pour some hot water on there just to thaw it out a little bit. <laughs> Cause I just got hardened, bro. You don't show right. that, man. Like, uh, uh, so I, I think uh, this, this piece, this emotional piece is so important, such a, brilliant insertion into the film that really kind of caught me in a way that was necessary, that was important to see that piece as a part of those relationships was critical. And so um, I think that's my quick response to that. Love it, love it. Brother Steve, just tell us something good. Yeah, so, you know, I, th I think that we have been, again, socialize, you know, this concept, this concept of toxic masculinity is something I deeply care about. Um, you know, I'm, I grew up, I grew up in a very toxic uh, environment in terms of my relationship with not having a father, with having uncles who, you know, you have to suppress your emotions. You have to, you know, mask when you have distress. You have to um, maintain an appearance of hardness, no matter what, to protect yourself. You know, I grew up in an environment where violence and fighting was an indication of power, right? And like, that's who my uncles, that's who my uncles were. That's who me and my brother, my brothers were. It was like, oh, we, we are the, you know, we're the tough guys. And even when you're not, you better pretend to be the tough guys so that nobody can, 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 will bother you. Right. And so I think that, you know, I think that we need to, as a society, move, recognize that like black men expressing themselves uh, in this way is a revolutionary act in and of itself. Right. And, and we, ha we have to reframe the, the narrative that that is what a black man is, tough, hard, you know, uh, manly, quote unquote, all the things that all the synonyms that we can throw out there. Uh, and I think it pushes us away from the humanity piece of just like we are, we are just humans. Right. And we have human right. sentiments and we hurt and we bleed and we feel and we love and we hate and we fight and we hug. Right. And we, you know, the. the it's just, we're just human, right? Um, but because, you know, hundreds of years ago, we were put on the chopping block, right? And we had to, you know, always fight. We were, we were always the ones who were the protectors, who were the, you know, the, the, the givers, who were the breadwinners, who were X, Y, Z. Um, we were not able to even al allow ourselves to tap into those emotions and really truly define for ourselves and for our species that like, brotherhood is a thing, right? right. Me, join, me going to college and joining my fraternity was one of the best decisions I could ever make in my life, right? And I grew up with my brothers, right? Mm -hmm. But this idea that we are now navigating this racially pol polarized space 
And now I, I found my black brotherhood that can help me through it, that can study with me for 14 hours in the in the basement of a library that will tell me about myself when I'm not like being the best version of myself that yep. I can have fun with that I can graduate with that we can build a network and an enterprise with like that's that's what I saw when I saw those scenes uh and it reminded me of you know me and my brothers growing up and sadly both my older brother and younger brother were murdered a couple of years ago um but the brotherhood that we had was one that was like you know, so dichotomous. We would hate each other, but you better believe that when we went and we stepped out uh, out to go to school uh, and we needed to fight somebody, we needed to fight somebody, right? <laughs> but there was there was there was a, a a sense of like love and camaraderie and and protection that we had that was sort of innate, and I I couldn't understand it until I honestly went to college and then joined my own brotherhood, where that same love and affection and and protection. Uh, and desire to see them succeed was magnified in a way that at 19, I didn't even recognize could be a thing, right? right. Uh, and so the brotherhood taught me that you can, it's not an either or, or it's a both and right. to be a black man and to, to, to redefine what it means to be masculine, to redefine what it means to, um, you know, show emotions and express in a way. And, I, I, and to be quite frank, I think that we have as, as black men, have have moved in the in the right direction and are moving sure. in the right direction, right? Sure. To yep. recognize that this is a place of power that we can walk in together versus us viewing this as a as a as a um, a lesser than trait. Right, without a Doc, doubt. Let me, Doc, let me sure. add something because I I Take think it. what 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 was really uh, worth acknowledging additionally in some of those scenes was the way they came. Even when they were in conflict, they came back. Came back. Mm -hmm. Right, like that, that. That was. I thought that was just so brilliant because I learned that in the hood, though. I did learn that in my yeah. neighborhood. My leadership style is based on relationships. That, like, Certainly. we can ball on Sunday. Talk about your grandma, your yeah. auntie, <laughs> your mama. We're gonna go through the whole family tree. Yep. But after we get through balling, we're gonna sit down. We're gonna chill. We're gonna still be family. I, I still carry that framework with me everywhere we go, and I was reminded of that in that film. Yes. That that pushing, that challenging, that 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 making fun of at times, but yeah. still those brothers came back, and I just love that they they still had that fellowship, that brotherhood, that Brother Stevens is talking about. That some seeking and finding some other fraternal kind of situations, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. also could be you know within their family situations because families we all evolve, we grow up, and so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think that's an important piece to remember that there can be love after conflict. Without a doubt. I remember in the movie, you know, uh, Malcolm forgets his camera, goes to the car to get it, and Sam pops out, what's wrong, brother? You know, you need security, isn't you? your camera safe in the black community, right? Uh, and then <laughs> he comes out later on, he's right there at the payphone with, you know, with Malcolm, checking in on you, everything good, right? And, and you know, I have, uh, I have similar experiences with those hardcore jokes with, with some of my fellas, even my brother who joined us on the call today, um, so, but that love is 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 uh, never waning, and I think that's something to your point, Brother Stevens, that we need to be able to normalize in a different way. We made a lot of progress. How can we begin centering that as part of the narrative? Let's transition to to some of the current issues we can pull from the movie, how they show up today, and, and have we really made them the progress that we're talking about? Not necessarily us per se, but society's view of us. Uh, you know, there's a moment in the movie where Jim Brown tells Cassius Clay, "Hey, I'm, I'm thinking about going into acting." Um, you know, really? So what are you going to do? He tells him he's acting in a Western. Cassius even clowns him there a little bit because Jim says his character dies. And uh, Cassius says, I should have known. But, you know, Cassius really tells him, like, look, you know, people know you for football. Like, I don't know if this is the right move you're making. And Jim responds saying, you know, and I'm going to quote here, you know, we're all just gladiators, Cash, with our ruler sitting up there in his box, giving us the thumbs up and the thumbs down. And I'm reminded of a couple of years back that Laura Ingram comment, the Fox News uh, anchor who told LeBron in the midst of activism to just shut up and dribble, right? Uh, how much of this gladiator mentality is still true today? Brother Stevens, I'm gonna go with you here. Oh man, uh, oh, so what's, what's interesting, I'm, I, it's, I'm interested in why you chose just that piece from her quote, right? Because right before, right before she said that, she also said, um, she said, I don't know why we're seeking political, what did she say? I don't know why we're seeking political advice from someone who gets paid a uh, hundred million dollars to right. drip ball, 
Right. Right. Yep. And I mean, yep. that that statement alone is really the one that, right. the piece that pisses me off because it completely dispels you know, the, the excellence that LeBron is, the, the, sure. the intellectual capital that he has, the, right. um, finan- the, the financial savviness that he has, the, you know, it, it discredits everything about him in general just because he dribbles a ball. And so that's what it first makes me think about. But right. I right. do think that this, menta- this gladiator mentality still exists in, in a way, both explicitly and implicitly for us, right? Sure. I think explicitly in that, Many of us, you know, if you're not an entrepreneur and working for yourself, work for organizations, right? Whether mm-hmm. corporate organizations, private organizations, whatever. Nonetheless, organizations that more times and often are run by white people, right? When you look at the boss's 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 boss, it's coming from the white man's dollar, right? Sure. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything necessarily wrong with that. We have bills to pay. I 1000% get it. My student loans are out of this world, right? Uh. But, but what I want... <laughs> But what I think, you know, what I want us all to like recognize is that, especially if you are a person, a person of color, we've been socialized to sort of uh, to like covet and romanticize this American dream that wasn't designed for us. It wasn't yes. designed with us in mind, right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. We've, been, we've been socialized to chase the title. We've been socialized to chase the promotion. We get excited by the little old bitty raise that they give us, not to mention our counterparts who don't look like us are getting bonuses three times the amount of our salaries, right? Mm. Like, and, and this excites us. And at the end of the day, I do believe that, that you know, we get lost in that. You know, we, we get lost by the thrill, by the dopamine, by the, the oxytocin that is that, you know, exudes from our body by this thrill of like getting more and achieving more. And we're getting closer to that American dream that we've been painted, you know, for all of our lives that we want to achieve. You know, just this concept of shutting up and dribble. I think we do that. You know, we might not be basketball players, but we we shut up and check that email at 9 p.m. We shut up and go into the office on Saturday. We shut up when that person just says something ignorant that we should have challenged because it de- undermines everything that we are as a people. But because we're the only person in that space, we don't want to say anything. All of that is shutting up and dribbling. So yes, explicitly, we are still the gladi- gladiators, right? Um, and I think in the, the implicit space is where we become gladiators, but it's disguised under this facade that our value and worth is truly being recognized in these right. organizations, yes. right? And, I, you know, I saw a meme recently on Instagram, two of them, actually, one said um, they recognize you, they recognize your worth. They just hope that you don't. And then the other one I recently reposted, it said something to the effect of like um, any organization that calls you a superstar, know that they're underpaying you. Right. Wow. And those are the, those are the input. And like I've been the superstar probably almost at every organization I've worked for, right? Which mm. is why I made the transition to work for myself because right. why I give my excellence to all these white people making money on my face and my name and my expertise when I can be building my own enterprise. But I mm. think the gladiator mentality, mentality like sneakily, sneaks, sneakily um, you know, impacts us in such a way that we think we're being valued, but quite frankly, we're being overutilized and undervalued and, sure. under, and underpaid. Sure. Without a doubt. Brother Moore, tell us something good. Tell us something great. Yeah, you know, we've been, we've been in this conversation about what's your value. I mean, it's a, it's yeah. a journey. It's a, it's a journey. I mean, I remember when a black, a brother asked me, cause I was pondering, I was, I was second guessing whether I was worth the, the amount, the, the small hundreds I was getting on those <laughs> weekends. I was second guessing brother, brother Stevens, you know what I'm saying? I, I was like, can I be worth this much? Right. Even right. Day I find myself just wondering, like, should I charge this much, right? Like, it's <laughs> it's a it's a journey, understanding your value, and I think that uh, part of it has been helpful for me in understanding the history of contribution that our people have given this nation. That that is continuing to fuel me to be more competent in now establishing that value, stating that value and saying that's it, Mm -hmm. but it's been a journey. Mm -hmm. This gladiator model to me is twofold. One, it is the way we're seen in, as Joe Fagan calls it, the white racial frame. Mm -hmm. We saw that in Jim Brown's initial opening, that no matter how pleasant this brother, positive this brother, intelligent this brother was, there was still a limited framework in which his good friends saw him. Mm-hmm. The N word, 
Yeah, yeah. That's what we exist in. And yeah. I'm sure all of us have faced that moment of standing outside the hotel and they wondering if you, those are your bags, are you watching the right. bags from somebody? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know y'all got one of those moments somewhere. <laughs> of course. Right? Yeah. The frame is so powerful that that's what I think about, came up for me when I think about that gladiator uh, comment. And then also continuing to fight out of that conditioning. Right. Because if they tell you enough, you can come to believe it. Right. And um, that's been something I'd like to own this. Mo I think Jim brought the movie helped me own some of my stuff and be checking myself up. And this gladiator piece is important. Yes. As I, like Brother Steve, is trying to build my own enterprise now and be okay with that. Right. Like saying yeah. I'm the boss, like jokingly sometimes with my team, but sometimes <laughs> taking pride in the fact that you got a black boss. Mm -hmm. right? I, don't. Like, I never thought, bro Brother Steven, never in my mind growing up, never did I think I'm going to be the boss. Uh -huh. Right. And so I think we got some good signs here on this screen. And I think there's other others out there, many others out there, of course, we know of, but I think we got a, we got a, we got a real task on our hands over these next 50 years yeah. since yeah. this film was put out there or the moment of this film was put out there in which Jim Brown was saying this, are we better? Is it better? I mean, I think that's up for debate, sure. but I do think we can all agree there's some work to do for our next generation of young, particularly black men. Without that masculinity is gladiator. Mm. It, it seems like those two are synonymous at times. Right, right. And right. so I think that um, asking people like, are you going to work for this organization all your life? Mm -hmm. I mean, have you thought of, have, I mean, this is one of the things I also ask. Have you thought about how much value you mean you bring to this place? Yeah. Right. I think. But I see what you hit it, just getting people to think about how they amplify everywhere they go. They're mm -hmm. teaching somebody, they're training somebody, they're forgiving somebody. I mean, I mean, that's some taxing stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that gladiator piece for me, brother Steve, you hit it. I, I just used to work through all of it, just plow through all of it. No self-care, no mental health, just right. Ah, just can't calm me through. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> I've just had to rearrange all of that, readdress all of that. And that gladiator piece there again, in many other parts of this film, same thing, just Resonates. had me focusing on some me stuff. And I'm just so happy that I, I, I had that moment around that because I think this is still prevalent today. Without a doubt. I remember, you know, you and I chopping it up for the more and, you know, provided me with some advice on really, if you ever enter a position or a new job, part of that negotiation should be, so if your, 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 your receipts, your track record in terms of um, not only do you get me, but you also get my connections, my contacts, the work yeah. I've done. And okay. so let me negotiate how often I'd like to be in, in space or, uh, you know, I want to still be on the road doing my thing because we will now become connected through that. So um, lots and lots of wisdom there. Let's jump to this next question here. Back in the room, uh, after they, they come back down from the roof, um, a lot of discussion happens and Malcolm critically calls Sam a bourgeois Negro, is what he calls him. Um, he follows up by saying that the problem with those types of Black folk is that, and I quote, you do something detrimental to your own people with the promise that after you get rich, you're going to make it up to them. Now, my mind immediately jumped to this negotiation that I know I have certainly dealt with and some of my other brothers that I talked to um, have also engaged in, um, you know, one's decision to, who, for those of us who are in academia, one's decision to attend and or work at a PWI rather than that HBCU, specifically because that PWI is going to provide more resources for you or set you up in a particular place. And you're doing so with the mindset that says, after I get this degree from UNC Chapel Hill, after I get these credentials from University of Arizona, what have you, then I'll come knocking on the door of North Carolina Central. Or, you know, then I'll come knocking on the door of some of these other HBCUs, uh, even Howard even, we hold in a similar 
uh, perspective um, that is not the same way we would look at maybe an Ivy League or even some of these PWIs. Um, my question to you is, have you seen this critique manifest, if not in yourselves in general, this idea of the promise that Black folks tend to make to one another, that after we get on, we'll come back and take care of you. And do we actually have a responsibility to be in the struggle in the moment, find a ways to create space for care? I'm gonna jump back to you here, Brother Moore, to kick us off. You know, I think we're in an interesting time. I mean, we've seen the move by Hannah Nicole Jones and Tananesia Coates in reference to their HBCU major moves. Uh, I think it's an interesting time we're in right now. We're seeing, I mean, a lot of times when people were talking about that, they were talking about the athletics side and, mm -hmm. and you're even seeing some of that right now. I think it's going to be an interesting next 25 years around this subject matter of what HBCU versus PWI even means, one being valued over the other. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I think we can't argue when it comes to Black excellence, Black genius. The track record <laughs> is proven so. in reference to HBCUs. I'll say this for myself, you know, as a young black kid growing up in Florida, I just was trying to get out, trying to get away. I never really grappled with whether it was going to be FAMU or Bethune Cookman. I was just like, get me out of this neighborhood, you know, so to speak, before I can have a chance to play ball. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think, though, I have battled with. I mean, even from a philanthropy standpoint, Brother Stephen, I think about what it means to be a philanthropist, what it means to even give back, to go back, give back. Because sometimes you don't even have to be back to give back. Mm -hmm. So I think right. I've even had some thoughts and continue to grapple with, um, you know, yeah, I have moved on from the projects in Punta Gorda, Florida, where I was, you know, a youngster growing up. And I can do some things differently than I was doing back then. And, 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 and I need to be thinking about, even though if I'm not back there, can I give back there? Right. And so I think for me, there can be some aspects of PWI, HBCUs. I think also around the aspect of giving back, philanthropy for me is what came up when I was thinking about that, that, that piece, this question that you raised um, um, Beautiful. Uh, Brother Sharar. I appreciate that. Brother Stevens. Yep. So this is, I'll, I'll put a disclaimer out there now that this might be very controversial, my, my, opinion, <laughs> my, <laughs> my opinion on this question um, as, a, as an education, as a former principal um, who had to navigate, you know, where to send my students at each year as, as you graduating from senior year. And so Dr. Brother Moore, I want to, I want to hone in on that throughout throughout what I'm about to say is grounded in black excellence and black genius. You use those two phrases and that really resonates with me because I think, you know, college in general, and I'm glad you brought it to universities, teaches you an experience. It teaches you life skills. It teaches you the intangible things that you need to know as you are navigating, you know, th this coming of age and what it means to be an adult in this world. Uh, and granted, you know, I, I have the degrees, right, mostly from PWIs, but the thing that I, I dislike about this statement that he said in the movie was the word detrimental. You know, if I were to go back and give them some feedback on the writing of this, I think that's such a strong word. And it makes me think of like, why does it have to be so binary? Why does it have to be so detrimental? Uh, you know, it, 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 why can't you do that simultaneously? Why can't you be a black man, a black woman, a black human going into a PWI and still fighting for the black cause and advancing our movement? Like, I don't think that two, these two things are mutually exclusive. And I think Malcolm tries in that movie to push Cook, specifically in this statement, in a different direction, arguing that the job of like successful black artists, right? Or for this, for this uh, context, successful black intellects or academics, mm -hmm. you know, isn't to court white approval, but to use their fame, right? Or their knowledge, their expertise in this context and talent to advocate and advance the cause of our own people. That's what Malcolm's getting at. And I think the yes. word detrimental, like just rubs me the right way. And so, mm -hmm. you know, as it relates to PWI, and HBCUs, listen, I, like I said, I am a PWI graduate. All of my degrees are from PWIs, right? Uh, and when applying to college, 
you know, being a, a Caribbean in the hood, you know, didn't have parents. Uh, first in my family graduated, had eight brothers and sisters, 13 aunts and uncles, 52 first cousins. The goal was to get into a school that one, gave me the most money and had a reputation of being competitive, right? And that just happened to be Cornell, right? Go Big Red. And, you know, now I did get into HBCUs and knowing what I know now as an educational leader and a former principal, this is the controversial piece, right? Um, and I welcome this debate openly. I know one of my friends is probably in the crowd right now. <laughs> cursing me out, uh, cursing me out. But, you know, as a high school principal, I was responsible for ensuring that my students went to universities that one, gave them the most money, and two, had a strong reputation grounded in quantifiable data and making sure that in four to six years as a black and brown student, they were able to cross the finish line, right? Mm -hmm. And sadly, and they're getting better, but sadly some HBCUs, I would say most of them were not, and I know the data, were not uh, giving our students the money that they needed that assured me that after their freshman year, they weren't going to leave and not have $25,000 worth of debt that they will spend the rest of their lives paying back. And that's important, right? And that's the conversation that we're not having about not just HBCUs, but universal, universally around what it means to go to college in general, especially if you are a person of color. Granted, even now it's gonna be worse after the pandemic, you know, right. quote unquote. But so all in all, you know, while I have dealt with this specific concept of the bourgeoisie Negro, um, you know, I've seen it manifest in many different ways. I think in my friend group, when I went to Cornell, we were still all black everything and we still were from the hood. Right. Like and we joined the Black Student Union, a president of Black Student Union. We were protesting mm -hmm. the racism that we fought at PWIs. We joined the Black fraternities and sororities. We created Black businesses on campus and supported each other. We graduated and pulled each other across the finish line, blood, sweat and tears. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that to me, this question speaks of. You know, whether you're black and you go to Howard Hampton or uh, North Carolina a t or you're an Aggie or whether you go to Cornell, Duke, nor uh, you know, Chapel Hill, right? Your identity and your talent and your expertise and what you bring to that organization should be the defining attribute to who you are and what you're going to do to advance our movement, right? And so at the end of the day, you being a black face in a white space or you being a black face in an all black face space, you are a black face and you have an obligation to our movement. Indeed. Wow. Powerful. Man, I wish we had more time to unpack that some more. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Here's what Ooh. we're going to do, brothers. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then I want to let the audience get in here. There's a couple of questions already there. Um, so I'm going to ask you to try your best to, to take this question three to five minutes. Um, it's a big question. It's really the question of the night, in my opinion. Um, so I apologize for bringing it up so late and try to put some limitations <laughs> on it. Uh, but I want to get at least 20 Ooh. minutes of audience questions in there if we can. Here we go. Uh, Sam tells Malcolm this idea. Everybody wants a piece of the pie. Well, I don't. I want the whole recipe. That's what he says mm -hmm. to him. And throughout the movie, Sam's trying to convince Malcolm that he's doing his part for the movement, um, sort of in ways that it would be tantamount to Malcolm being out there. Uh, because he is economically free. And this is a sentiment that's supported by Jim Brown even. Sam has ownership of his own label. He has a master's to his songs. Um, he's determined his own creative destiny. He tells that story of the Rolling Stones covering uh, one of the Muddy Water songs or one of the songs he, uh, from his artist. And he says in response, uh, you know who makes more than the writer of a song that goes number 49 on the Billboard charts? Mm. The writer of a person who, the writer of a, of a song that goes number one. And so he's like, I already knew that. And, and uh, that's why I let them cover it because every time they do, they put money in my pockets and the pockets of my black artists, give it back to the particular community. This economic freedom is a statement that was also echoed by Jim Brown in the movie, but also later on, Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton, just a, a series of years later, he passed away, was murdered in 1969. So within this same time frame, my question to you is, is Sam, uh, right, correct in his economic, and uh, in, in sort of the, the idea that economic freedom is true freedom? Or was this mindset merely uh, a result of capitalism and ultimately suggesting that Malcolm is right to suggest that true freedom is equitable worth and independence, this idea of being acknowledged as a human being? Brother Stevens, you got to kick us off. Man. I know, I saw the face, but <laughs> that's, how the order, that's how the order rolled out. <laughs> I know, I know, yikes. Um, Three to five if you can, if you can. Yeah, 
Yeah, I don't even know the answer to this. There's no right answer. So I think like, I mean, come on. We live, <clears throat> we live in a capitalist society, sure. right? We're, we're, we're in America. We, you know, we have phrases both externally and within our own community, you know, secure the bag. Right. You can't, right. You, can't, you, can't, you, can't you can't say that phrase to a millennial, a person of color, and them not know exactly what that means. We write songs about it. We have memes about it. Where, where the money reside, where the money reside, like everyone is singing that. So it's a song. Right. And so we, we, we live in a world where I think, you know, especially as as a person of, uh, where, well, one, you can monetize your entire identity on social media. You can monetize just who you are. We see uh, we see five-year-olds who are making millions of dollars of sharing their five-year-old thoughts on food, on clothing, on reviewing their toys. Like, are you, are you kidding me <laughs> on YouTube? So, so I would dare to say that like, you know, in this world where money seems so easily accessible yet so terribly difficult to obtain for some at the same time, that yeah, economic freedom is one type of freedom. And so I'm about to take the cop-out answer and not choose a side, but it's, <laughs> It's, 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 one, it's one type of freedom that does open up the door um, to, to, to have an access to a lot of different other critical components of capital, whether that's human capital, whether that's social capital, uh, et cetera, right? And so, especially for a community like ours, you know, for mm. hundreds of years, we were deprived of all forms of capital. So, of course, we will get excited about the economic, right. economic capital that we get. And so, you know, yes you know, we can be independent. Yes, I think he used the phrase like ec equitable worth, but mm -hmm. are we really ever free in this country? Like, that's the question. Right. Whether you got, like we saw that from scene one. So this is full circle that this that's is the right. last question before we uh -huh. even go to audience questions. Like this is full circle because yeah, ca cash is clay. Yup. And you still was paying the white man for training. Yeah. That's right. Michael X and the internal conflict. Yeah, Jimmy couldn't go in just to help the white man, right? right. And so, you and, and even this scene specifically of like, hey, I want the whole pie. You know what's important, what's more better than being 49 is to be a number one, right? right? And so are we ever really free is like my, my, my question here. And, you know, just yesterday I was on Instagram and I read the story about the two police officers in one of our richest counties in the country in New Jersey, in a very affluent neighborhood mall where two young high school kids were fighting a black and yeah, white kid. Black and, white, yeah. and immediately it's clear as day, immediately as day. Without second thoughts and without you break up the fight and the police Slam uh, the slam the man yeah. down, the young boy, Black the young man. boy. Let's talk yeah. about the like, right. young yes. boy down, and immediately handcuffs him. Right, and young so Black boy. that this is Black boy. This yeah. is February 2022. I have examples from January 2022, from January 2020, from January 1990, from January 1964. Like yeah. this doesn't, you know, we can, yes, economic freedom is a form of freedom, but like I think this concept that he's talking about in this in this scene is almost unattainable. Right. Like it's almost right. unattainable, right? And so why not lean on getting economic economic freedom as a man of color in this country in order to level the play? Feel in order to give back, in order to gain more access, so that you can do more, uh, and so like I think that's that's all in all. I think like building generational wealth is very important for us as a people. Mm. We know like I wake up and I I walk into. I walk into meetings with people who have billions of dollars. And like you were saying earlier, Brother Moore, as a child from the hood, I would have never imagined that I'm in spaces where there are billions, multi-billionaires, right? And sometimes I'm just like, well, how the hell did you get that? And like, mm. I need to get it too, so that I can have this sort of like power or prestige, et cetera. But really, will you still then, you as a person of color, use that to make sure that, that you are freeing not just uh, literally, but figuratively, the minds of our people as well, mm -hmm. with the power that you obtain through all that you're working hard to get. So That's right. in, in a nutshell, yes, economic freedom is important, but this other concept of equitable worth and in independence, when I'm driving my BMW in New York City with my Cornell, NYU, Vanderbilt, Mason, Phi Beta Sigma, uh, the, all my accolades on the back, <laughs> The cops not seeing that they seeing this N word in a BMW. That's right. And I, and I need to, and I need to figure out what's going on here. Right. And that's, so that's right. Yeah. It, that's I want right. to talk ever about it, but I'm gonna shut up. I appreciate it. Like Malcolm said, when you call a, a black, a black man with a PhD, the N word. Right. Mm -hmm. Ex exactly. So, yep. Brother Moore, take us home. 
uh, man, three to five if you can. You, you, uh, it's, it's, it's a good one. It's a good one here. Uh, listen, I, I'm, I'm a Sam Cooke fan. I believe in that model. I hope so. <laughs> I want the recipe. I like that as a mantra. Mm -hmm. I do like that. I like that mindset of two chains, of yeah. recipe. I like that because that's a shift, particularly in that industry. So I do want to go back to what I call Harriet Tubman. I mean, you ain't free if you ain't free in others. So I think that's what Malcolm was hitting at. I think that's what was the sweetest part of the ending to me because it felt like Sam came to sink, came in sync right. with that. Uh, yeah, that yeah, yeah. yeah, you can stay at the Fountain Blue, but who are you helping, bro? Yeah. Right, what seeds are you planting? Are you using your artistic form to shift, to change? You know, I think we see a lot of economically free people in our society, but I don't think we see a lot of them freeing other people. That's right. it. That's and it. that's what I think, that's what I took away from there that I think I want to try to keep living by that's is it. really pursuing economic freedom so that I can free others to pass that formula down. The recipe, it should be free. And it. Um, it took me so long to even get an understanding. Now, as Brother Stevens is saying, he's in there with people who've been seeing the recipe in their diapers. Yep. Right. They got it in their Similac. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's that's where I'm at with that. That's that that piece, like it's it's fitting that it comes to an end this way. Cause yeah. that was powerful. That that song, uh, it just hit me right when he started to sing that it felt like Sam was coming in the sink. That that freedom is not yours. Right. You right. ain't free unless you're free in others. Right. Beautiful. Brother Moore, Brother Stevens, thank you all for your wisdom, your intellect, uh, you know, your, 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 your words in general for, for tonight. I think we all learned a lot. And I know I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able to host such a dynamic discussion and dialogue. What I want to do now is I want to turn it over to the audience, the participants, to ask any questions you might have. Um, you can enter some questions into the chat or into the Q&A that's in front of you. Or you can go ahead and raise your hand if you want to speak up and I will unmute you and give you the floor. Um, there's already a question in the Q&A section, so I want to go there first. Uh, I don't know if this is specifically targeted at any one person, so I'll open it up to you all. Uh, appreciation for the conversation, some love there. The question is, however, how do you position this notion for folks like me who look Black, uh, live Black, uh, and move through the world as Black, but who are of mixed race? We have white parents and relatives and uh, a whole other culture that we don't identi identify with. Simultaneously, we can be perceived as not black enough, which is painful when being black is what we feel most connected to. Growing up, not only mixed race, but mixed culture is enriching, but is also challenging when it feels like you're stuck between two worlds. Either one of you brothers wanna tackle that, the floor is yours. Brother Stevens, I'll say quickly, listen, um, uh, Martin, I'll tell you, I'm blacker than black. I'm, as they said in Colin Kaepernick, I'm blacker than black. <laughs> but I tell you what, I've been through that same journey. Just because uh, you may be multiracial, you're not the only one dealing with this black struggle, this what black means struggle. Particularly as Brother Stevens alluded to, when we go to predominantly white institutions, we go back home. I mean, people start to see you differently, no matter what your skin tone is, from my experience. So I, I, I would say to you, the key is the journey to understanding your blackness, your, your central core, and that that takes time. And it's not what they call you that's important. It's what you answer to. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have too much to add. I, you know, it makes me think about like the, the one drop rule, right? And, you know, it's like if you got just an ounce or just a, 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 a you know, a, a, just a drop of blackness in you, you are black, right? And I, and I think to a certain extent that even becomes a tool of, of white su supremacy in, 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 in and of itself, right? But um, I, from my own personal experience, right, and phenotypically, you know, you look at me and like, I'm a black man, I identify as a black man, little, very few people know, 
my dad is 100% Puerto Rican. My mom's 100% Guyanese. I, I, Spanish is my first language. You know, I am a Puerto Rican Guyanese man in America, right? I identify as Black. Um, and growing up, I was always like either too Black to be Hispanic or too Hispanic to be Black. And I still deal with that. I'll go Spanish speaking countries. I go visit my cousins and they're like, oh, you're a gringo. Like you're, you're American now, et cetera. Right. And I've always had to battle with this sort of like identity, so to speak, crisis. But I think at the end of the day, I know who I am. Right. I know my values. I know my cultural affiliations. I know my racial affiliations. I know exactly who I am. And that took a lot of time to define who you are and to and to 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 navigate these the, 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 the my own identity identities and the intersectionality of all of my identities, because that's not all who I am. Right. I'm a brother. I am a Christian. I am X, Y, Z. And so I think the more self work that you do to truly identify who you are, the values that you hold true to your, your near and dear to your heart and, 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 and try to define like your, per, your passion, purpose and the reason that God has placed you on this earth to impact in whatever way. I think that's when you truly begin to walk in your power and walk in your identity and you're able to say I am an X, Y, Z. This is what I stand for. And this is the legacy that I want to leave behind. And so my advice for anyone who's dealing with that is to continually do that self-discovery. Uh, and, you know, sometimes be, be okay with that marginalization and like be okay with that struggle to identify who you are and what you want to bring and how you want to identify. Um, and, you know, just, just stay the course and, and, and make it happen, but it has to be true to you and don't let anybody else tell you you are, or you are not. I love it. And sometimes, you know, the black community, we can be our worst enemies especially in the conversation around colorism. It was a question I had in here we didn't get a chance to get to around <clears throat> Jim Brown's observation in his mind was, you know, it seems to be all y'all light-skinned cats who are the, have the loudest voices. Mm -hmm. You know, are you trying to prove something to yourself or, or to the Black community? I mean, mm -hmm. what, you know, uh, because of, 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 this, of the skin that you're in and that relationship to to this dual world that, that Martin was talking about. So uh, thank you, Brother Springs, for that. A question popped up in the chat I want to make sure we get to. Brother Marshawn asks, uh, do you all, do you guys think that uh, the Willie Lynch letter plays a vital role in racism, the gladiator piece in our current state of Black men, Black people in general? So that Willie Lynch letter, folks familiar with this? It's that letter. Okay, wonderful. So do, the question is, does, do we think that plays a vital role in racism and this gladiator mentality as we think about black men and black people in general. Now we're talking about the 1712, we're talking like the old Willie Lynch, okay. That's right, let me help you control folks. Hmm. State the question no. again. No, go ahead, brother. If you no, I was just gonna say there's some urban legend around Willie Lynch, the letter, the actual letter, but I don't think there's any <laughs> urban legend around the the breaking of the black man. So I think I right. want to stick to the truth of that. Mm -hmm. That yes, that that conditioning of gladiator, that narrowing of the potential of the excellence of black genius mm -hmm. uh, is real. And to take away its language, to take away its its family bonds, its family connections, that is real. Yeah. And so I feel like there is um uh, there's still some healing to do around that. And the letter in its urban style uh, did have a prediction of 100 plus years or something to that effect of still rippling throughout society. Right. And I think that there's some truth that Joy DeGruy wrote to, writes about in Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, that the behaviors, the, the experiences of our ancestors still reverberate, reverberate, echo, mm -hmm. ripple into the society and to the behaviors of us today. And so I think um, Resma Minikin's work around my grandmother's hand is really just, again, an opportunity for us to be remembering some of the injurious, violent, uh, outright devastation that our ancestors received in the coping mechanisms to withstand that so that we could be here today and for us to be on a healing path, and I say this well, you know, I say it well, y'all. I, I don't always practice it as well as I can articulate it, but I do think even myself need to be better at the healing path from the time of Willie Lynch or the behaviors of the Willie Lynch letter yeah. to the gladiator uh, kind of scenario that Jim Brown spoke of that I think 
we alluded to still has some remnants today. Yeah. Yeah, I, to, to echo what you're saying, Brother Moore, right? It, it makes me ask the question of like, do we, do we live in this space of distrust as people? Do we treat each other, like, are we treating each other, you know, we talked about the colorism and it, may, it makes me think of that scene from, um, what was the school days, right? And like the, the old adage of AKAs being light skin, the brown paper bag tests and all that stuff, right? Um, and like you said, I think that the, the healing piece is the most important part where we need to push ourselves and, and I think that as a, as a people, we are advancing in that in that area. I think of like some aspects of our movement, whether you agree, disagree, are a fan of the Black Lives Matter movement or not, et cetera. Um, one, can't, one can't detract from the fact that it is a movement that has unified us in a way that we have not been unified in, uh, in like other initiatives have not unified us in, in, in the last 10 years of, of, of our lives, right? And so even if that was the the purpose, if that was the one thing to bring some of us together to think more critically about the economic function of the black dollar and how we can increase it, the black love and black support, et cetera, that you know, we are getting closer to combating the gladiator effect because of some of the things that have happened. And so when I think about that, that letter and some of the sort of like, you know, can we control this control aspect that exists, I think we are slowly breaking away from it. I don't know, you know, we don't have the secret sauce. If we all had a magic wand, of course we would just wave it and be like, everything is great. And the, you know, black people are, you know, equality and, you know, justice and liberation is all among us, but that's not the case. Um, but I do think that we are, we are advancing the cause and, uh, you know, we might not see it in our lifetime. I tell my students this back when I was a principal, like, listen, you know, I'm pretty sure Martin Luther King didn't think that like his impact was going to be that great. I'm pretty sure that Mar Ma Malcolm X didn't think that X, Y, Z. I'm pretty sure, you know, you know, Rosa Parks set so that we can walk. And, you know, that that phrase of like advancement that portrays this, that illustrates this larger picture of advancement. You know, every day I wake up to be a social justice agent of change and it might not exist in my lifetime. Time. But I have right. nieces and nephews who are six and seven years old that I have to think about. And by the time they are 40 and 50, I want them to be on a Zoom screen, you know, or whatever they're doing. They might be, who knows what they're going to be holograms. doing. Right? <laughs> right, holograms, right? <laughs> but I want them talking about the moment that three Black men got on a screen to simply uplift each other, to feed into each other, to feed into our community and to discuss something that was so important. And I think that is what you know, dispels some of the things of gladiator mentality and some of the notions that were existent in the Willie Lynch letter. I love it. We have what looks like uh, one final question. I'm going to open it back up afterwards in case folks want to chime in uh, from the good Dr. Stephanie Troutman Robbins. And this question is, uh, in your opinion, gentlemen, uh, who are the black men in this discussion today slash now contemporarily? Uh, in other words, which four black men, famous celebrity, et cetera, would be coming together from different vantage points or perspectives today to talk about the present day issues facing the black community. So mm. these opinions. Wow. <laughs> Almost pointing to you, Brother Stevens, because you've been in that world, you know, you got, you got, a, little, you got a little connection in that world. Fair enough, you know fair enough. I second that. <laughs> oh man, no, listen, I'm, I, I'm, try, I'm trying to get like them. I'm trying to get like y'all. Um, <laughs> wow. You know, I think, so I would have, I would, I would start, I want to like think about my list even more, but I want to start with my good brother, who's a very close friend of mine, um, brother DeRay McKesson. Uh, you may or may not know him. He is the, the gentleman with the, known for the blue vest, but DeRay and I started Teach for America together and we've been great friends for many years. Um, and I just, I just watched him. I, I remember seeing him even when we were like 20 years old, fresh out of college and going into Teach for America, right? This organization is like, oh, you just take elite people from elite universities that do two years and give back and then go become lawyers and doctors, et cetera, and mostly white people, right? But the majority, but the black folks that were in this space we were still educators and social activists and all the things. And he, I watched him when we were young and he was just always a social activist and always moving the needle and always bringing all the black men together and teach for America. There's like four or five of us, so not a lot. But just the idea, when we think about brotherhood, when we think about this movie, I think about DeRay and, um, you know, he has a, a podcast now, Pod Save the People, and, has, you know, is has been quoted in the millions and he, just a phenomenal brother who speaks uh, life into this movement that we call the Black Lives Matter movement uh, in such a profound, different, profound way. And so I 
think that he is someone who is revolutionary and doing the things that we, you know, he's not only walk, talking to talk, he's walking the walk in this piece, um, you know, protesting and supporting, um, you know, um, victims of gun violence in various cities, et cetera. And so he's just one of my, I'm one of his biggest fans, even though he's one of my closest friends and I just appreciate and love him. So that's me giving him his flowers while also talking about someone that everyone needs to know in the movement. Indeed. Anybody come to mind for you, Brother Moore? And I, I think about if I could watch four guys, you know what I'm saying? I love um, uh, LeBron's barbershop show, oh, yeah. you know, because yeah. it gives you a little Shop. sneak peek of if he could gather, if we could gather. And I think in those spaces, there is some of that, there is some of that happening. I remember mm -hmm. watching him interviewing uh, Jamie Foxx, you know, mm -hmm. and, and some of the folks sitting around. So I think that show gives us a little sample, at least at the level of what the movie was at. Right. But I right. want to go back to Brother Stevens' point. I just think there's so many people out there every day, every day, as they say, mm -hmm. just grinding that many times folks don't know about mm -hmm. um, that are sacrificing, waking up. I mean, especially the educator today amongst this, uh, in the mix of these last two years, the pandemic, I mean, you just got to give a shout out to the people we don't know. Mm -hmm who are going in every day. I think of one brother for me, it's Thomas L. Salone. And this brother's out of Philly. Now he's up in the Northeast somewhere doing a principalship. And he's got this shirt that's called, I Choose to Stay. And um, just a solid educator. Mm -hmm. Just won't mm -hmm. leave the school building. You know what I'm saying? He could be anywhere <laughs> doing anything. <laughs> And that's the brother I would shout out, similar leader, Dr. Stevens saying, you know, there's some big names out there. I wish I could see him. I mean, we see some of them on the barbershop show, but let's give a shout out to the brothers out there going to work every day and giving back and, and putting in to a field of work that we'll never see the end result of. Mm -hmm. And so that's my shout out uh, in reference to that question. And, and I actually, I do have my lineup now. I apologize because it's not, you know, in the world of inclusion, it's not just just men, but um, I, it would be DeRay McKesson, who I already named. Uh, it would be Tamika Mallory. It would be uh, Mark Lamont Hill. And it would be, um, uh, what was my fourth one? Mark Lamont Hill, Tarika Mallory, DeRay McKesson. Uh, oh, and, uh, and Natasha Alford. Those would be my okay. Favorite. All right, I got a name for it. Then I'm going with Hannah Nicole Jones. Uh -huh. I'm going with Two Chain. <laughs> I'm going with Cornell West because I need some old school in there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I'm gonna speak, <laughs> um, sprinkle in um, Sister Garza from the Black Lives Movement. I love it. I love it. Those are some strong squads that, and once that ball was up in the air, I think we're okay. <laughs> Either direction. Here's our final question, and thank you all again for hanging tight with us. Um, from good friend Malia Dunn. Shows a lot of love, deep appreciation for the insights tonight. Question is, sort of as you continue your walk and your work in Black excellence and Black genius, what mm -hmm. sustains you in the work? And how do you care for yourselves and your well-being? This will be our final question of the night. Wow. Well, I'm going to leave uh, the door closing to my good brother, Dr. Stevens, because I got a feeling... He's used to turning out the lights. So uh, <laughs> let me start by saying, um, you know, part of what sustains me is I am an educator. I'm a coach. I love my job. I mean, I love the work that we do, that we literally have the ability to change the lives of young people, to say things in a classroom, in an educational space, in a conference space that could literally transform somebody in an hour, mm. in a day. I mean, I just think that's a remarkable position to be in. Yes. I love it. I love it. That keeps me going, knowing that any moment, at any event, I can make somebody do something remarkable. Love that. Mm. Now, how do I take care of myself? I had to learn how to do that because I thought working hard was just taking another job, you know, putting in a few more hours. Like, mm. I thought the weekend was how you recover. Right. I mean, yeah. I got that old school four job mama, if you know what I mean. 
<laughs> and so I really seriously had to revisit self-care. I remember Brother Stevens thinking, man, those folks in England, how can they take four weeks off for vacation? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some lazy people, man. Who takes four weeks off work? What do you do for four weeks? <laughs> right? I thought something was wrong with taking that time. So to Malia's question about self-care and taking care of ourself and well-being, is I had to revisit that. And so now I'm on a radical self-care plan that there are things I just got to do. There's, there's things I got to eat. There's things I got to do with my body in reference to exercise. And sometimes there's just times I got to chill. Mm. And so for me, I had to really revisit self-care and make a, a concentrated commitment to make it happen. Brother Stevens, take us home. You know, I think what, what um, one, self-care, right? Like I, I have this, this new concept that I've been talking to folks about. You know, I think we have always been uh, socialized to think about work-life balance and not really thinking about uh, work-life harmony, right? And we, we live in this world where nothing's ever gonna be balanced. Right, you're not. It's, you you are never going to have fifty percent of being a good brother and then fifty percent of being a great son, fifty percent of being a great employee and then fifty percent of being a great best friend, right? But like when you think about all the intersectionalities of your identity as a brother, as a best friend, as an employee, as an entrepreneur, um, as a runner, as someone who uh, loves the gym, as someone who is a foodie, none of those things will ever be balanced. And so I think that like when we move our, when we have a pedagogical, um, a paradigm mind shift, mindset shift of not trying to create balance between all of these things, but to figure out how all of these things can be harmonious in your day, be harmonious in your life, be harmonious in your week, that is when you truly begin to walk in in like who you are and live the the, the live the 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 life that you want to lead, right? Um, and no, I think on that journey of of discovery and creating that harmony, it's going to be very challenging. But you have to find what works for you and really stay true and grounded in your your values. And so, how I view self care is really recognizing one: I'm going to give myself grace even in the moments when I don't want to. I'm going to work towards harmony every single day, knowing that nothing's going to be balanced. And when, you know, I try to create balance is actually when things start to fall apart. Uh, and three, just recognize and have, have empathy for others, right? And I think that, that that puts you and propels you in a space of like understanding the plight and the, the, the challenges of like what other people are going through. And I think my mindset has really shifted in some of the things that are, uh, in, in how I build my emotional resilience. I just read this book by Dr. Perry and Oprah called What Happened to You that really pushes you to think about, you know, uh, why a brother Moore or why, you know, this person or your friend or the, your boss is acting this certain way um, is less about, you know, about, about what you think about them, but more about how they were, what they experienced in their lives, right? And I think when you take that approach, not only with other people, but with yourself of like, wow, I'm heated in this moment, or I'm angry in this moment, or I'm fatigued in this moment. You really have to think about the experiences that you're creating. And so when I think about harmony and self-care, I try to push myself to really just tap into who I am and what's, what I'm experiencing in that moment, live in that moment, be grounded in that moment. And I think that fills my cup. You know, one of my close friends always says, you can't, you know, fill other people's cup if you don't pour into it your own. And I think that's where you start in terms of self-care uh, and harmony. Uh, and so the second part of your question, what sustains me? I am sustained by the fact that I know that I am not alone in this movement. You know, I'm wearing this shirt right now, male educator of color. And, you know, you know, male educators of color make up 1.7% of the entire workforce in this country. You know, out of the 3.4 million teachers and educators in this world, that's about 50,000 men of color who look like us in 3.4 million. Uh, and I'm going to a conference wow. even next month where I'm, post, where I'm hosting um, uh, aspects of the conference where we get to come together and just be black men, expressing love, expressing challenges, you know, relating in a way that like, we only have a weekend once a year where this, where we come together and we're allowed to like, just, you know, let our hair down for lack of a better phrase, right? But to, but to be ourselves, 
and just be with one another who understands what we are going through. Mm -hmm. And that actually sustains me, right? And so what I what I say to people is like, you have to find your tribe, you have to find you know, the people who are going to tell you about yourself when you're not being the best version of yourself, but also, you know, pull you by, pull you across the, the finish line, no matter what, right? And so what sustains me is knowing that there are people who might not be in the same space as me physically when I'm in these spaces of oppression, when I'm in these spaces of being the black face in the white space, but I know that there are brothers like Dr. Robbins and Dr. Moore who are also fighting the same fight that I'm fighting in Arizona and in DC, and in Denver, and in Tallahassee, and in New York, and in Abu Dhabi, right? Like the fact that I'm leaving tomorrow to go to a space that I don't know how I'm gonna be perceived as a black man in this space of conservatism in the Middle East, but y'all actually have called me to come. So, you know, I have value that I'm bringing to this and it sustains me to know that there are people like us on this screen that are advancing the movement forward without the fame, without the acknowledgement, without the Instagram followers, it doesn't matter. As long as we're impacting one life and changing one life each day, that makes me happy. And I can go to sleep at night knowing that I've done my due diligence for the world and fulfilling God's purpose. Beautiful. Brother Stevens, way to close that out. Gentlemen, we're at time. Thank you all so much for taking the time to connect with us and everybody who's in attendance all over the country. Thank you all for carving out some space for us as well. Um, I just wanna close by saying uh, thank you all so much. This has been recorded. We will release this um, sort of as the year continues. Give, give us some space to kind of decompress a little bit. Uh, and uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't plug really fast, Dr. Eddie Moore Jr., his national conference, international conference, excuse me, the White Privilege Conference, will be in Charlotte, North Carolina next month. I believe we are the 8th or the 9th to the 12th. Um, I'll be there presenting. Um, of course, Dr. Moore Jr. will be there along with a stellar list of keynote speakers. Um, if you are able to, to register and you haven't, make sure you go ahead and do that. For those who are here in Arizona, we will be back in Mesa. I wanna, I wanna say it's Mesa next year for WPC as well. So if this year doesn't work out, but next year does, Get in touch with me. We'll talk through some things and try to work out a registration for you and get you involved. Uh, that being said, thank you all so much. Uh, Dr. Steven, safe travels tomorrow. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Moore, we'll catch up sooner than later. Everybody else have a good night. Be safe. Have a great night. Thank you for this.